everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Exchange. My name is Pastor Tim. I'm the campus pastor out in Niverville. Of course, we have Pastor Mark joining us. And we have a very special guest today. We have Pastor Andaza Hezekiah joining us from, we'll get to know you where you're, what church you're a part of and right. all that in a moment here. But I want to let you guys know that today we are covering a wide range of topics and we want to invite you to be a part of the conversation. So if you're watching us on YouTube Live or Facebook Live right now, we would love it if you could flip on over to churchoftherock.live. That is the chat that I'm watching today and I'm going to take your questions, I'm going to save them and I'm going to ask them of our panel today. So for topics today, we're going to be talking about elections, vaccines, race relations. We're all over the map. Unity in that. The title today is Not Everything is Black and White. Pastor Mark, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's both literal and figurative. We got a white man and a black man having a conversation, <laughs> only you're not like completely black and I'm not completely white, but that's okay. That kind of goes to our theme. And then of course, you know, virtually we're talking about the fact that everything is not always cut and dried. Life is messy, life is complicated. We're gonna dig into some of the mess. So that's what it's about. All right, mm -hmm. well, get us started. <laughs> All right, well, so grateful you're joining with us. I know you're gonna be intrigued and interested in today's conversation. It is gonna be kind of all over the map, Tim, as you said, but uh, we're gonna answer your questions if you have them and listen to your comments, always interactive as it were, and uh, we're gonna dig into it. But I wanna start by introducing my guest, Andaza Hezekiah, pastor of Joy Fountain Church and my good friend, <laughs> my brother from another mother. Uh, there you go. Right? <laughs> And how, how long have you and I known each other? By the way, thank you for having me uh, on the exchange today. Um, how long have we known each other? Yeah. It's gone back a number of years. I started coming to the uh, citywide prayer, uh, pastor's prayer gathering, and uh, um, I met you, I think I shook hands with you, and I was wondering, okay, maybe I need to get a little closer. Uh, but it happened, I think, after a couple of years. So probably maybe seven years, I don't know. But uh, a little bit closer the last number of years because I attend a, a meeting of a, a group of pastors uh, and we spend time sharing and caring for one another. Yeah, you and, I, you and I have really got to hang out together yes, and yes. network together and yes. learn from each other. That's right. And I've really enjoyed our friendship. Same here. And, Same and, here. and learned a lot from you. And, yes. and, here's, and we're going to find out more about you in just a moment. But mm -hmm. here's one of the things I really love about you is that you've come from a Nigeria and uh, we have lots of Nigerians in this church yes. so they're gonna be interested in that you said so yeah. and you've you've come from Nigeria come to Canada come to Winnipeg you planted a church and one of the things I find most intriguing is how hard you've worked to learn and understand our culture in order like a missionary going from any foreign country you've come in you've learned our culture and you understand it almost more than anybody I know including people who are born here mm-hmm well, yeah, you know what? Uh, there's something in being, I think I call myself a cross-cultural missionary. And I believe that I'm meant to reach everyone. I mean, there are people who are called to reach specific groups of people. But back to what you said about friendship, I've really enjoyed you. You're funny. That's one thing. And you have a way of throwing truths and barbs with truths <laughs> surrounding the barbs in a very, very healthy way. So I've really enjoyed it. But uh, coming to Canada, starting a church here called the Joy Fountain was really an experience for me. I... Uh, First of all, I was afraid. I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing, how I was supposed to go. But I felt God was calling me to reach people, to create a mosaic of our city. And that's the future. We so can't let me just ask you, yeah. interrupt for a second here. Yes. So when you were describing your church, yes. it's not a Nigerian church, is it? I wouldn't say so. It's a church with, uh, that has it, uh, eth ethnicities that represent what our... If you go on Wikipedia and you type Winnipeg, you find uh, uh, 67 or 72% of Winnipeg is uh, of European descent. And then the rest is divided into... That's exactly what we're seeing in Joy Fountain You would have 60 to 70%... Uh, European white. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, of course, there would be some Nigerians there. Oh, yes. Right? Always. Yeah. And, exactly. and collection of other people from exactly. everywhere else. Exactly, yes. And so you, I know, I know this, and I'll, I'll just sort of run through this quickly for people. You pastored in, in Lagos, Nigeria. Yes. Many of our people here have come from Lagos. Wow. You moved, <laughs> moved in 2005. You started Joy Fountain yes. Church in 2007. Uh, by the way, that does sound a bit Nigerian. Just thought you should know. <laughs> you hear a name like that, you you know there's a Nigerian behind it. Okay. You've got three wonderful kids yes. that uh, two of them, or one was born here, two two in Nigeria. Yeah, that's right. And I happen to know, and I've got pictures of a couple of them. Okay. That they're major, high-level athletes. They are. I'm not. 
<laughs> so you know. And I happen to know your eldest daughter is on the uh, uh, University of Manch uh, Winnipeg, Winnipeg, rather, right, Westman, yeah. Westman basketball yes, team. Yes. And so she probably gets her height from you because you're all of what, five, six? <laughs> <laughs> is that meant to be funny? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is meant to be funny. <laughs> my grandpa was tall. Yeah, but my wife and I are the shortest in the house. Oh, okay. So, and, yeah. the, and then, then your son, who's in this, the second one, right? Yes, Samuel. Uh, Samuel, Faith he's Samuel. on the Ma You've Manitoba Bison football team. Yes, that's right. Defensive, linebacker. Yeah. He's got his mean face on there. <laughs> uh, does he have a smile, too? Oh, lots. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're going to have a mugshot like that, you've got you to you know, be mean looking if you're yeah. going to play football. And then, of course, you have another son born here who also plays football, but he's younger, so he has Philip, a, yeah. But so you've got some high-performance athletes in your yes, family. they got it from their mom, to be honest. <laughs> oh, very cool. Yes. Very cool. Yeah. Anyway, just, just uh, give us one last thing about your church that maybe we would know, just so we can get to know you a little bit. Tell us one more thing about your church. Our, I would say our vision statement is, surrounded, uh, is immersed in three words, prayer, purpose, power. I, when I was walking through the hall, I saw that. Uh, I've seen it, you know, over, but today I just got reminded there's something about purpose here. So prayer, if you pray, you'll find uh, purpose. And if you find purpose, God will give you power to accomplish divine purpose, whether it's for a season or for a lifetime. Do you like alliteration? Do I like? Alliteration. When words all start with the same letter. Uh, yes, 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 I do that even in messages. I <laughs> yeah. do that all the time. <laughs> I have a little penchant for that myself. <laughs> a little. <laughs> it, it, it either has to be alliteration or it has to rhyme, but ideally both. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it helps the message come across quickly, easy, and people grab it and remember it. Easier right? to remember, isn't it? I agree, Especially yeah. with your vision statement. People are going to remember that, yeah. right? Prayer, purpose, power. See, power, I've got it yes. already. Exactly. I could pass to your church. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we want to launch it into this conversation today. And uh, like I said, we've got a lot of stuff to, to cover today. As usual, it's going to be a little bit controversial. We like to mix it up. We don't, we're not afraid of the sticky issues. And, you know, at the end, we're going to kind of draw it all together and, uh, you know, make some sense of it. But I want to throw a verse up uh, for our viewers. And uh, it's an important verse I've always held dear to my heart. Ephesians 4, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And the word endeavoring is interesting because it means to work at or to maintain or to protect or to guard. It's not passive. It's an active word that you are not going to have unity if you don't work at it. Mm. And the second part of it is in the bond of peace. So, you know, as we're working towards unity, like let's say you and I or our churches together or our friendships or our family, you have to work at that and you do it not through aggravation and dragging each other through the mud. You try to find that bond of peace, that thing that kind of joins you together. So, so that's a, a little bit of our, of our, our theme for today because we're going to be talking about things that divide us. And so when we get to the end, we want to talk about how do we become united in all of this? And Andaz, I don't know if, if you agree with this, but I personally have not lived in my entire life a season that has been as divisive, divisive as I've seen right now. People are divided on everything. Their politics, masks, vaccines, uh, their, their color, their race, their religion. The list goes on and on. What do you think? I would agree uh, myself. I mean, I grew up in a, in a country different from Canada, and uh, there, every you know, my friends were. I had Muslim friends, and uh, till uh, as I talk to you, I have a WhatsApp group where I'm, I have friends from high school who were of different faith, and we all used to go out and play soccer. Today, you know, it's different, and and I see the same thing happening uh, in different parts of the world, but more so in Canada. Like, you know, it, you would think that this would never happen, but I do agree with you. This is a very, very divisive times. Do you think Canada has changed in the 16 years you've been here? Yes. In what respect? Uh, you know, it seems that there are people really, things that never used to offend people, uh, it, it, it's almost like people are on, on, on edge. There's all this very little things are uh, triggers today. We've become a hypersensitive people. Very aren't sensitive. We? Offended with everything yeah. and everybody, yeah. right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so at the risk of like offending people, uh, the, one of the big things that just happened, uh, we didn't know this when we planned this program, uh, you know, months ago, but was we've had, we're now in an election. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we are, our prime minister, less than two years into his mandate, has called an election. Lots of speculation that, that his primary motive for doing it is so that he can get a majority rather than the minority. Not that I think the minority's really hurt him. He's been pretty much been able to do whatever, whatever he wanted yeah. in all this time. So, so those are, you know, that's what people are saying. Uh, he's getting a lot of criticism for the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic or at least at the end or wherever we are in it, but another wave coming. Uh, here's what I find interesting. This is maybe the first time in life, my lifetime that we have five major parties all left of center. We actually don't have, really, if you look at their platforms, they're actually pretty close together. We actually don't have any conser real conservative or people right of center. Do you think that's right or wrong? I think that you need people right of center. I think you need a balance of power because if, 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 if people, if everything is on one side, then you're, you're just gonna go, if it's, it's going downhill, there's nobody to check. The, the vehicle going downhill, then you go downhill faster. That's an accident waiting to happen. Do you think we have that check? I do not think so at this point. And we need to wake up. I need, something has to happen, something has to change. It doesn't yeah. appear so right now. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I just got, I'm gonna throw the numbers up. These, these are the latest poll numbers. It's really interesting. Oh my goodness. This is only okay. in, in a week. They poll every single day during an election campaign. And so in only a week, we've seen some, some dramatic changes there. The red line uh, at the top there is the Liberal Party support. The blue line is Conservative Party support. You can see those two lines have, have merged. Uh, most polls are, you know, they vary a bit. This happens to be the Ecos poll. Uh, but you can see they're almost in a dead heat at the moment. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll tell you what those numbers mean just for our viewers. Uh, and Not everybody's interested in politics, but I am. I think it matters to us. It matters to our freedoms. It's important, yeah. It is. And, and so uh, at 33%, let's say, nobody's, nobody's getting a majority. But the liberals could win at 33, 32, 33%. They could get a minority. They would need more like 35% to get a majority. Uh, the conservatives, who are really in second place because their support is not as widespread across the country, it's more concentrated in certain regions, they actually probably need 35% to get a minority, minority and probably 37 or 38 to get a majority. So that's what we're looking at, and it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a tight race. And so as a, uh, you know, not a real recent immigrant, but as an immigrant, do you follow politics? Do you follow this stuff? I do. I tend to follow the politics in the U.S. for certain reasons, but I do follow Canadian politics also. Ever since Trudeau came to power, I have always, you know, watched, listened to see what's going on, what's happening. One of my biggest concerns is, um, and I say this one as a citizen of this country who moved from a country, uh, oh, you know, I came here as a missionary, but also um, because there's, uh, you know, better, most of the people who are immigrating are doing that because uh, Canada has always been number one in the best places to live when, you know, it, it's all compared. But I'm concerned because I'm beginning to see the same attitude of those in power happening like it happened in the country where I was born and raised. What do I mean? Um, because it's a slippery slope, and once it starts, it just keeps going. When, when, when people in government can do anything and just get away with it and continue, and con at some point, you know what? It's just going to go downwards, and that's my concern. I is that, just so yeah. the viewers are clear on this, yes. is that your experience from back home? Oh, yes. You know, I, I mean, recently there was something that happened in Nigeria where we had this uh, NSARS, and people were, uh, were um, protesting uh, government policy that they were not happy with. And it went to the point where a lot of uh, young people went and sat on a certain highway, you know, protesting government yeah. at, uh, at night time. And uh, soldiers appeared from nowhere and uh, the lights went off. This is street lights that are controlled centrally and went off and then shots rang out and they just murdered these people. And, and nobody, no, no, and the government says, no, we don't know anything about it. Put, who put off the lights? Though, that kind of thing. Now, and, we, and we haven't was, seen that. this was fairly recent? V very recent, yes. Oh, yeah. So we haven't seen that in Canada. But the point I'm making is that we're sliding towards the place where, um, I, I, for me, it appears that the prime minister's office has so much power. And what I admired about Canada was the balance of power. 
uh -huh. where, you know, I remember when Stephen Harper was in power, I think he was there for about nine or 10 years. And then, you know, you, you want to see that. You want to see that balance. And I'm really, I think we're at a scary place. Uh, for most people, I'm not afraid because I know where my hope is, you know, no matter what happens. But it's important that um, we pray and seek the help of the Lord that we have balance. I, I have nothing against the prime minister. I pray for him, but I'd like to see a situation where our people are accountable for decisions. Well, we'll, we'll jump into that a little bit, but let, let me ask you a question. Like most, most immigrants, you said, come to Canada because it's one of the best places in the world to live. I always tell our congregation, you're already in the promised land. <laughs> you're, you're here. <laughs> and don't lose what you've got. But having said that, uh, you know, one of the things that they look for that makes it such a great place is liberty and democracy. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're here. Most, play, most people come from nations that don't have the kind of freedom and liberty we have. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, as a, a relative newcomer to Canada, that those freedoms are eroding? I feel so. I really think so. Especially when you look at uh, the question of mandating vaccines. Maybe we'll talk about that later. I don't know. But that I was shocked to see some of the um, and the extent of the lockdowns. I do agree that there should be a lockdown before how long? You know what I mean? Because sometimes when you extend things like that, you know, at the end of the day, who really suffers? Yeah. Our, my, my, my wife owns a business. I know what really happened as a result of the lockdowns and many other people. People lost their businesses yeah. as a result. But we know who actually became richer. It. Right. It's a big companies, right? Yeah. And uh, I know people that are church who are buying from the moms and pops, doing whatever, whatever they could to order from restaurants who are owned by locals. Why? Because they didn't want to see the businesses go out. Right. You know, Am uh, Amazon did just fine. Yes. Oh, yes. The pandemic, yes. Didn't they? Exactly. A and uh, and yeah. the mom and pop or the corner store they, they the ones who suffered incredibly yeah. and were closed most yes. of the time. Yes. But let's jump into that. You brought it up, so let's jump into it. Okay. So you mentioned vaccine mandates. Mm -hmm. you're, you're opposed to them. I, I would, uh, if, I, if there was a vote, I'm opposed to it, yeah. And see, most people don't really understand this. And, and I, I want to take a moment and dig into this because when it comes to the vaccine, some, some 75, 80% of Canadians are vaccinated. Good, good for them. They're you know, protected from serious illness and death, not necessarily from getting it, but at least they're protected from that. So then they hear, okay, we want vaccine mandates. So if you, you, know, you can't go to your job and you can't travel and you can't get on a bus and you can't get on a train, you can't cross a border and the list goes on and on. And they look at that and go, well, that makes sense. I'm, I'm vaccinated, so, so you know, we should impose this on everybody. And what they don't recognize is by allowing government that kind of power to mandate that you inject something into your body that maybe for whatever reason you don't want to do, then what you are doing is you are stripping yourself of your civil rights and freedoms. And the destructive power of that, the fact that people are willing to vote for that is unbelievable to me because that's what one of the wedge issues, I mean, there's a few wedge issues, but that's the big one. This is the one the prime minister has gone, driven the stake in the ground. And he's saying that, if, you know, if you vote for me, we're bringing in vaccine mandates. We've got Mr. O'Toole, he's saying, I believe in the vaccine, but I'm not going to mandate it because I believe that people deserve the freedom to make their own choices in life. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I, I'm, I, you know, people have said to me because I, I post sometimes on Facebook and they say, uh, send me messages. And how can you say such a thing? You're not showing love to your neighbor. Um, that's not the issue here. The issue is that we're allowing, we're giving more power to the government to tell us where to go, where not to go. You can't go to the park. You can't do this. You can't do that. If someone has been double vaccinated, why are they really concerned about, you know, because if the vaccine doesn't really protect you, then what's the problem? What, you know, then why do we have the vaccine in the first place? Uh, but um, when, once you mandate something, and remember that there are still people today suffering from vaccinations that happened years ago. Kids were vaccinated. And that's one of the reasons why even the FDA, I read that, um, uh, the, you know, uh, their um, uh, article uh, that they put out regarding, um, you know, approval and all that, that a, kids under the age of 12 should not be vaccinated, you see. Now, but I believe that in the population, there are people, this is, I'm just, this is just my opinion, because it's happened before, and we should learn from history. There are people who are going to come up with all kinds of difficulties o over time as a result of the fact that this vaccine, it was rushed, we needed a vaccine, there was COVID and all of that, that kind of thing. And we know more about COVID now than we did when it first 
uh, first happened. We're not a stranger to it anymore. Yes, there's variants, but we can now cope. This is not like the Spanish flu time 100 years ago or so when we didn't have all of the um, what we have today. And what surprises me also is I look at it's it, what makes it look sinister is the fact that I look at countries in Africa who are go people going about their daily businesses, enjoying their lives, having a good time. And in countries where you have higher doctors and hospitals per capita, we're mandating, look at what's happening in Australia. I don't think that is being shown on the news, how people are being wrestled to the ground, three soldiers on one poor individual who was unarmed because they're doing it for his own good, for his health's sake. That kind of thing, you know, it's really, really scary. Yeah, yeah, and see, I, I think you and I are on the same page. I wasn't sure before this uh, time here together, but I think we're on the same page that, that when you give governments these kinds of powers, to sh close borders, to, to shut down stores, to impose stay-at-home orders, curfews, then you're starting to look like countries people came from and ran from right. because they didn't have their freedoms. And I think that's one of the major things that's at, at stake in this election. People need to really think this through, what kind of government they want. And here's what's happened. We know historically this to be true, that, that when there are emergencies, that's when governments are, can have the freedom to uh, suspend liberties and freedoms. And they will often do it. And it's also those times of emergencies when dictators rise up. That's right. And historically, yes. We, yes. we see this. And uh, I, I wanted to take a moment, and I want to, I want to give our viewers a little, little snapshot of history, because uh, in the 1970s, 1970 exactly, we had this thing called the October Crisis. And the FLQ uh, was this liberation, uh, you know, Federation Liberation of Quebec. And uh, they were a, a domestic terrorist organization. They kidnapped two men, Pierre Laporte and James Cross. They murdered one of these men. Prime Minister Trudeau, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the senior, he imposed the War Measures Act. And in this mer emergency, he suspended civil liberties and freedoms. And they had search and seizure, arrest. They could break into people's houses without cause. Probably some 500. Over one incident. Over this incident. And they, over 500 people were detained from their own homes without cause, without search warrants, without any of these things. And there's this fascinating video that I want to show from mm -hmm. 1970. There was a, a journalist with the CBC named Tim Rolfe. And he confronted Pierre Trudeau on the steps to the, of the parliament buildings. And in those days, the, the video is interesting because uh, he just gets out of his limo. The, uh, the journalist confronts him. They get into this seven minute long debate. And mm -hmm. it's all about freedom. It's all about democracy. Mm. Tim Rolfe got uh, disciplined. He got suspended for doing this by the mm. CBC. They later thought it was one of the biggest mistakes they made because they felt later on after the fact that the prime minister did need to be confronted on this issue. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna run the clip. People can look at it and you and I will have a conversation about it. Here's the clip. Sir, what is it with all these uh, men with guns around here? Haven't you noticed? Yeah, I've noticed them. I worry you people decided to have them. What's your worry? I'm not worried, but you so seem to be. So you're not worried? What's your, I'm not worried. I'm, I'm worried about living in a town that's uh, full of people with guns running around in it. Are you? Have they done anything to you? Have they pushed you around or anything? They've pushed around friends of mine. Yeah? What were your friends doing? Trying to take pictures of them. Aha! Uh -huh. Is that against the law? No, not at all. But what you're talking about, I, to me, is choices. Yeah. And my choice is to live in a society that is free and democratic, which means that you don't have people with guns running around in it. All right, then you and, one of, and one of the things I have to give up for that choice mm -hmm. is the fact that people like you may be kidnapped. Mm -hmm. sure. I still go back to the choice that you, you have to make in the kind of society that you yeah, live well, in. Well, there's a lot of bleeding hearts around who just don't like to see people with helmets and guns. All I can say is uh, go on and bleed, but it's more important to keep law and order in this society than to uh, uh, be worried about uh, weak-kneed people who uh, don't like the looks of, uh, of a soldier. At, at any memory. cost? At any cost? How far would you go with that? How far would you extend that? Well, just watch me. That's his famous line where he says, just, just watch, watch me. me. <laughs> I, I, love the, I love the setup on this. It was really casual. The prime minister was casual. It wasn't a scrum, wasn't a press conference. They were having a conversation on the steps. He was debating with them. The prime minister was answering the questions. Yeah. But 
What it was, was the beginning of this journey of concentrating, you had already mentioned it, concentrating the power into the PMO, the Prime Minister's office. Mm -hmm. And historians have pointed back to that and they said that was the moment when the Prime Minister of Canada became like a president rather than one of a cabinet and That's the right. whole structure. And now we're looking at what's happened in this, this emergency we've had for the last year and a half. Our freedoms have been suspended without parliamentary approval, without mm -hmm. votes in the House, no. without committees studying them. And these just these grand sweeping gestures being made from the PMO and Canadians have st stood back and say, well, I think it's for the greater good, but where will it end? And when it's all over, will they stop? That's my question. Yeah, history has shown us that every time governments have said it's for the good of society, it never ends well because absolute power corrupts and corrupts absolutely you know and when i look at the west today and the slide towards socialist ideology and marxism it bothers me and i know people just go oh no you, you know this is just scare uh, uh, tactics from the uh, conservative aisle but that's not true i'm not just talking about being conservative i'm talking about freedoms that are god-given and having said that, okay, I have a perspective that is from an Af African perspective. I'm white, I, I've, I've read and studied other countries, but one of the examples that I would like to throw out here is, you know, going back to um, what happened with uh, Tanzania in East Africa. Um, Julius uh, Nyerere we was- have a, We have a picture, because you had mentioned him yes. earlier. There he is. There he is. So Julius Nyerere is somebody that really inspires me. Um, he was uh, uh, what I, was it president of Tanzania from 1964 to 1985. And he tried a system of government called Ujama. Ujama, I think, I hope I pronounce it right. Ujama, because I'm not Tanzanian, I'm Nigerian. Uh, Ujama, which is a version of socialism and uh, based on people living in communal groups in villages and then fending for themselves and all of that. But they don't own anything. The government owns everything. It was a version, there was no doubt about it. And socialism basically slides towards com communism. It's always that, been that way. So, but after trying it for decades, he voluntarily pulled back and said, we've tried, it doesn't work. What I don't understand is today, you don't read the CBC, the, the New York Times, all of these major newspapers in Canada and the United States do not celebrate this individual. Why? Because when you look at those papers, they are also socialist in ideology. Most of our university campuses today are also, you know, in that uh, line of thought. And that's where, you know, all of this is coming. And people feel, oh, you know what, the government knows better. The experts knows better. And we're not really thinking and asking ourselves the most important and valid questions about where this is all going to end or where this is all going See, to See, I've never heard of this fellow. No. And so, so what is the end of the story? What happened with Tanzania? So Tanzania right now is not a socialist country. It's not. And, and they're... they're due, due to this man? Well, because... Uh, they tried something that didn't work and they allowed other people to now come, you know, uh, there was, uh, it was one party rule. And, and the idea behind one party rule is we know everything. We found out how to get you people to a, some utopia in the future, right? And, yeah. But it didn't work. Right. And the economy was in shambles. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, when people are only working for the minimum, I was saying to my wife today before I left home, I said, when the government decides to start giving everybody t uh, toothbrushes, handing out toothbrushes, you will lose your teeth very soon because it won't be good quality, <laughs> you know? You know, because if you make toothbrushes and I make toothbrushes and people are able to look at both toothbrushes and decide which is, oh, this is, Mark's own is better, you know, or, or yours is better. Well, then there's some level of competition and we yeah. improve. And, and that's how I'm, I'm going to make a note of that to buy my own toothbrush. <laughs> people own are toothbrush. people are wondering here, like we're yeah. talking about government decisions, yes. you know, how we're so divided. And people are asking, is this because we're approaching the end times? Is this the world order reset and things like that? What would you say? <laughs> you know, I'm not a, I'm not, I once, uh, early this year we did uh, studies on Revelation and all of that. So as a preacher, here's what I would say. My opinion about the book of Revelation is interesting. I think people should read it. I think that um, when people think mostly that it's a timeline of events and this is what, we're, nobody knows the time of the second coming of Christ or the, uh, of the rapture when he'll take saints from the world. We should be ready as tonight or tomorrow morning. You know, because we will see him one day. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, with respect to that, I think that this, these things are cyclical. 
um, evil always rises and God proves that he is God by shutting evil down. So if there is evil happening in the world today, we'll see God rise up to prove it. Why? Because on the day of judgment, he can point to people and say, see, see what I did. Because he's a fair judge. He has to show people that there was evil and you saw my hand come through. You heard when my preachers were preaching and I came through and I did something to show the world that I'm still here, alive and well. <laughs> so it may or may not be a sign is what you're saying. <laughs> what else are you hearing online? Uh, so this is, I don't know if we can answer this question, but someone is wanting to know, will your churches uh, provide letters of exemption on the vaccine based on their scriptural and moral objections? You know, I That's can answer that yeah. question. We actually can't do that. No. Uh, we are not legally empowered to do that. I, people have, have been asking me that. Can you write me a letter of exemption? I said, on what basis? <laughs> and they said, religious basis. And I said, what religious basis? You know, I want to know what that is. And so I did a little research into it to discover whether if you can do that. And so what that means is if you were like, let's say a Jehovah's Witness and you cannot, and your whole organization does not do blood transfusions, yes. you could write a letter of exemption on, on that basis. But on a, as an individual, one by one case and saying, I'm objecting on religious basis, they will not accept that. So mm -hmm. the answer is we can't write any letters. Mm -hmm. uh, someone's that, the follow up to that is, uh, will the church stand with those Christians who have stood firm? Not sure what you're standing firm. Oh, you board, have to define how they've stood firm, though. Yeah. I th oh, you can let, stand let's firm assume that what stones. they mean is they're standing firm and, and not getting a vaccine. In my position, you know what? If, uh, if people feel that that's what they want to do, there are consequences. Because you see, the government, if they decide to mandate something, they have power to do whatever they want to do. But if, if, if majority of the citizens won't push back and say, no, you can't mandate, people are going to suffer. It's always the, what happens in history. But down the line, if we are on the side of truth, people will come back in leadership who will be judged harshly for what was done. Today. Let, me, let me be more specific about yeah. this even. So supposing the provincial government in Manitoba makes it mandatory for vaccines in churches and we have to start scanning people's <laughs> uh, certificates, what would you do as a pastor? As a pastor, I can't turn people back from you know, coming into the church. I'll encourage people. I like to know what's in the vaccines. Why, why is it so serious? Like, why do we have to? Because if you go on Statista and look at the death rates, you'll be amazed. There's a website called Statista. Um, go on there, do your research. People should do their research. The, I want to ask questions. I want probably would, uh, that's the time where we have to march to um, what you call them here, uh, uh, parliamentary buildings and, and, and demand that people be allowed to live their lives. It's too much encroachment in my own opinion. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'll do. Maybe when we get to that bridge, we'll cross it. That, now, yeah. you, you don't object to people. I, I, don't, I don't want people to misunderstand yes. you. You're not an anti-vaxxer. No, I'm not. not. You're not, not suggesting not. people I, don't I, get the vaccine. I'm not. I'm not an active. Uh, uh, when I was a child, I got a vaccine. One of the things I hate most in my life is needles, right? And yeah. the dentist chair. I don't like those two things. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm not against the vaccine at all. Right. And so I, so I think we have similar positions on this and I'm public about this, that, that, I, that I'm not prepared to turn people back at the door and not everybody's happy about this. You know, they, they think you should just let vaccinated people in. And I'm thinking, you know, I think it's a really what would Jesus do kind of question. Mm -hmm. uh, do we really think Jesus wouldn't let in lepers, that Jesus wouldn't, you know, uh, let in the prostitutes and the sinners? And I don't think so. I think, I don't think we can, we can erect artificial barriers no matter how important they are for the health and safety of the nation, we have got to take the gospel to the whole world. And the day they tell me that I can't invite people to the church, I will stand up for that. That would be, yeah. And I think there should be a lot of pastors who should stand up for that. Um, you know, I saw pastors who were attacking a certain other pastor for, um, you know, uh, you know, keeping their churches open and all of that. While I didn't do that, we we're having online services and all, and I think people should be wise about how they do these things. But the ones who are attacking, I checked and I found out they don't even have a congregation. They just have a reverend behind their name. <laughs> They've never baptized anybody in the last number of years, you know, yeah. and, and you wonder what are they about, you know? We wanna be out there preaching the gospel, helping people, supporting people. At the end of the day, um, I, like I said, we, we get to that bridge, we'll cross it. But I think that um, it'll get nastier because it doesn't really make any sense to me with respect to how this is not Ebola. 
you know, you, you remember Ebola? Yeah. yeah. It was a couple of days and you're gone, right? Yeah. You know? uh, this is not the same thing at all. And I'm not saying that COVID isn't real or that it, is not, it isn't harmful or that people didn't die. But um, yeah, you need to really check. And there is information that we don't have yet where people are asking the government for more information about this whole thing and we're not getting it, yeah. you know? You know what, I'm, one of the things I've tried to do is I've tried to empathize with a government leader and I've put myself in that role and I've thought, what would I do if I was one of these leaders and I believe firmly that everybody should be vaccinated? So you understand the temptation to coerce and scare people into it. Mm -hmm. And I, so I get it, I know why they're doing it. I'm not at all uh, lost on that. But for me, it comes back to, is that the kind of world that we want? Do we want to live in a society that is not free and not democratic and we don't give people the right and the choices over their own body? We have all these politicians that call themselves pro-choice. Mm -hmm. I would call this another version of pro-choice. It's, it's like saying my body, my choice, right? Yeah. And, and I asked one question of a couple of people who had, I had had conversations with. I said, Canada is a G7 country. When COVID was ravaging the land, I was shocked that our military would go to places like Afghanistan, Iraq, um, you know, uh, the countries where there's, you know, conflict and they would build hospitals. I think the military can build hospitals in 48 hours anywhere. They're called field hospitals. Yeah. And the, I remember that uh, the Ontario uh, Premier was in talks with the military to do something like that early 2021, I believe it was. And, um, but something happened where Nobody knows why it wasn't done. And that would have happened all over the country. If, we, if the beds were full, the military could have come in and assisted um, provinces here and there. We have detachments everywhere. But why wasn't that used? Nobody has, I've asked that question and maybe I should send a letter out to say, why wasn't this being done, you know? This is not, uh, you know, a third world country. Why wasn't that done? To at least reduce the pressure on the hospitals. I have one last yeah. question kind of on this that kind of piggybacks off of that. We kind of talked about the church's response. Someone said, regardless of your beliefs on the vaccines, yes. and we're seeing a lot of opinions on the vaccines in the chat. Let's try to keep it to what, our, what we're talking about, those of you in the chat here. Um, regardless of your beliefs on the vaccines, as children of God, how are we to behave in this time? <laughs> we should love one another. Uh, <laughs> but some people will say, well, loving one another is go get the vaccine so that you can protect your brother. But um, there are people who have health conditions. I know someone, um, I won't say their name, who has confided in me about their health condition and they're worried about what to do. And they just can't put anything in there, but they're really, really scared. And like I said, a time will come. And that's why we have to leave people because as a Christian, you know, when you look, you have maybe 300 people in your congregation or a thousand people, people are different. You can mandate everyone to get baptized on the same day, to get born again. We're not, this is not an iRobot community, you know. So if they've vaccinated 75, 85% of the population, I think we're doing very well. And if right. there's a certain percentage that are different for some reason, and that's why today, you know, they say certain people have different orientations, whether it's sexual or whatever it is, and leave them alone. And then, you know, if, why is that not the same here? They say, well, it's for your health's sake. Well, you know what? At some point, we have to agree that... Uh, you should let people live and let live my body, my choice. We're going to shift gears here in a moment, but I do, I do just want to say this. You know, some people have accused us at this church of being neutral on vaccines oh. because they want us to either take a stand on one side of this or another, which we're not prepared to do because of the whole issue of what I read earlier about uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And it, as soon as we take a strong position on one side or the other, we've alienated a bunch of other people. And Paul said what? He said, I will be all things to all people. Kind of an impossible task, but you try. And you try to accommodate people. And I, I want to create a very, very safe place here for people to come to church. We also have an online option, as you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the day, I'm hoping that we keep the vast majority of people as part of our body and that we learn how to love one another and how to care for one another and how to forgive one another. And if I don't agree with someone's position on a mask or a vaccine or whatever, I am not going to let that divide me from them. Hmm. Speaking of which, let's, let's shift gears and let's talk about the issue of race. Mm -hmm. Because race, <laughs> race is a, a you know, fascinating thing. And, and uh, you know, I love the fact that you had shared that you have this multi-ethnic, multicultural church, as do we. And I think in Canada, 
I think we're kind of leading the world in how we can get along with one another and see each other in the image of Christ rather than see ourselves based on our color. And there's an interesting video. Uh, I want to take a moment and show this video. This man's name is Emmanuel Ocho. Did I say that right? Yeah. Uh, and he uh, is a former uh, football player, and now he's a sports commentator. And he does these conversations. He's also written a book uh, called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And uh, this particular one, he's put himself in a room with 35 white policemen. And he's having this conversation. So we got one little clip to show you. Here it is. Do police officers make you nervous? Heck yes. <laughs> now, what if it was a black police officer? Nah. It's different. So black people often navigate white spaces as a foreigner. As I sit in this room, I'm one of three black people in here. You sit in this room and you're one of 35 white people in here. It's, it's natural for you. Yeah. You're home. Whenever I walk into a room, a restaurant, church, anywhere, I'm looking for black people. Just in case something pops off, it's like, okay, we here. <laughs> Me and you, like, we, we're, we're together. Because so many black people in life have probably gone through some sort of struggle, yeah. there's an instant connection. And it makes you relax a little bit, le a little bit more. Or, yeah. I mean, you're still dealing with a cop, so you're nervous naturally. But it's, 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 if I can now be honest, I see he's black before I see he's a cop. Right. I see you all are cops first. I love that clip. I love what he's trying to do. He's trying to have these conversations where you deal with reality and some of the struggles. And, uh, and uh, so I wanted to ask you, as a, a, a black man who came to a predominantly uh, European white country, which is rapidly changing, by the way, uh, do you resonate with what he's saying or not? So, so his story, his experience is different. So when he generalizes, I beg to differ on the general on generalizing because a black man in America, depending on where that black man lives, is different. But I'm a black man from Nigeria and immigrated to Canada. When I see a policeman here in Winnipeg, I'm not nervous because of that experience. I get these flashbacks because the police in Nigeria uh, the kind of experience, uh, they're good ones, but it's not anywhere near, it's worse, it's terrible. I mean, um, there are cases where people are just taken on the street and uh, for ransom by the cops themselves. They're good stories, but there are a lot of bad stories, a lot of bribery and a lot of crime within the f uh, police force itself. So, 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 so just to clarify this, yes. so the color of the skin yes. means nothing to you. You'd rather encounter a policeman in Canada than in Nigeria. Exactly. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Because I, I, yes, I would. So in Nigeria, even when we visit or go overseas to other countries, um, my, my wife and I, you know, we're always like, oh, you know, when we see, the, there's always this tension because you don't know how the police, you know, maybe it's in Kenya or in Nigeria or in Ghana or I mean, Ghana has changed a lot in the last number of years, but th that's the, first, you, you, the there's some nervousness because of what has happened to us you know, with police in Nigeria growing up. We've not had very pleasant experiences. Now that's, his own experience is valid to him. He's speaking of his own experience, but I don't want people to think that every black person you see going on the street, uh, you know, would be nervous when they see a policeman here in Canada. I don't think so. Maybe if they came from the States, they'll be concerned because they think police here are the same with over there. Let yeah. me ask you a really direct yes. question on that. Yes. So uh, what we've heard a lot in the last you know, year or so, since the death of George Floyd, Black yes, Lives yes, Matter, yes. is, we, and including from lots of preachers, particularly American ones, yes. uh, standing up, proclaiming their nation as systemically racist. Yes. We've had politicians both in the US yes. and in Canada. Yes. Canadian politicians who said our institutions are systemically racist. We've got to. Do you think that's true? Do no, you, I don't. Do you agree. live in a systemically racist? No, country? I don't agree. Well, okay. systemic racism is racism that is institutionalized. This, to me, this is my opinion. It's coming from the universities. 
Okay. It's coming from liberal studies, you know, and, and then it's permeated all. If you're studying for medicine right now, you have to take one of those liberal studies that, you know, propound all of these theories. They're called theories, but they're hypotheses. I don't know. It, it, um, we're living in a time where science is one, one track. Um, you know, theories from, the, uh, from um, liberal ideology is one track. There has to be challenge. You know, you have to allow to fertilize ideas and then come out with a, prop, with a theory at the end of the day. But it seems it's one-sided. Um, so... I came to this country in 2005. So systemic racism in Canada, let's talk about it. The most advanced African group in North America today are Nigerians. When Nigerians arrive, the ground shakes. <laughs> <laughs> because they are very passionate, they are. we are very hardworking. Many Nigerians have three degrees. They have no problem studying and studying. I'm not one of them. I went once and I said, that's it. But I do a lot of reading. We read, our people are well, and, and, and I mean, I mean in, 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 in the United Kingdom, Nigerians are respected. You, and in Canada. And, and I, in, my and experience with Nigerians exactly. is the same, highly educated. And, and the church in Nigeria is very advanced. They're bad things. Anywhere you see the church growing, you would always see all kinds of sure. nonsense. But the point is that we are doing well. So I got here. In the first 10 months, I bought a house. I had no credit history. I had no, I mean, if there's systemic racism, it'll select me as a black person and make sure I'm standing outside the bank and waiting longer for my mortgage. I bought my first house, then we moved to a second one, we rented that one, and on and on and on. The point is, nobody stood in my way and said, oh, you can't buy a second house because you're black. You see what I mean? Well, there's some racism in Nova Scotia. I have friends over there and, you know, but it's not what it used to be. There's been some improvement. Here's my concern. The media has a role to play and they have to change. I think most of the media really need to repent. The reason is this, when they find something that they can use to divide, I don't know what, what, why the media does that. Would anybody from CBC, I challenge the media to come to this church and find that there are people from different parts of the world sitting by, side by side. Lakewood Church was founded by John Austin in 1957, I believe. From 1957, in the time of segregation, black people were sitting by white people. No press cameras went in there to report it because it's a narrative. As long as we can keep the people separated, the votes would go to the side that placates, that plays to the side that is the question when people say black people are suffering in America and all of that. I ask them, why are more black people leaving Nigeria to go to the United States, to Chicago, to Philadelphia, to all these cities that are populated by black? Here's the thing. If black people say they are suffering under white people like it used to be in those days, I don't agree because that's not my experience and that's not the experience of many black people. Systemic racism may exist, but in a tiny, r racism is on life support as far as I'm concerned. And the only way it's been kept alive is by the big media industry. Because as long Tur as they do Turns that, out you do have an opinion on this. <laughs> I do. Did I say I didn't? <laughs> and so media is fanning the flames. I believe media and academia are fanning, fanning the flames. The flames. Give me, give, take a moment, and, and I don't know if you're prepared to answer this question, yes. but try. What's the difference between racism and systemic racism? Racism is uh, treating people, you know, um, poorly on, on, on the, uh, 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 with respect to their race. Uh, why, and that can go both ways, but people don't agree. People say, oh, no, 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 only white people are racist. And then uh, systemic racism is institutionalized. You know, I say to people, I watch Canada. I, I've studied, I've done a lot of reading. There is, you know, the Sikh in 1914, there was a ship called, I forget the name of it, I think it was uh, Komagatha Malu. A Japanese ship arrived in Vancouver in 1914. And it had 377 Sikh people, you know, the ones with the... Uh, and uh, Sikhs are brown, generally speaking. There are some that are closer to white. Than, but there were 30 Muslims or 20 on board. The Canadian government turned that ship around. And they went all the way back to India. And then they got shot by police, Indian police, and 20 people died. It was a crisis at the time. 106 years later, you look at the Sikh population in Winnipeg. And all, there are 500 and something thousand Sikh people. They are advanced, they are focused. They are not carrying placards around and saying, oh, look at we, we, the white people are killing us. These guys are strategic and they are doing what they have to do. That's what minorities have to do. When I see black people running around in Canada and say, oh, there's racism, there's racism, and they're running around and trying to push people out of government, I say to them, the people who need our help right now are the indigenous people. But what are we doing? You know what we're doing? Churches now, before they preach a sermon, they say, this land we're standing about to preach belongs to the native people. You know what that reminds me of? It's like people who have been married for 30 years 
who keep apologizing for their first argument when on their honeymoon <laughs> night. That marriage is a disaster. <laughs> and if you really care about the, 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 the indigenous people, what we need to do, get all these billionaire companies who made money from COVID vaccines, get them to build roads in the reserve, get them to get the res reserve people out of boil water advisory. It upsets me that there are indigenous people here who can't drink water, take a shower like you and me, and yet, the go so you see, is, 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 is the press really concerned about them? No, they're not. But as long as they can keep the division and the people say, you know, the white people stole our land. The land stealing has been happening for many years. And by the way, land trade has also been happening. But the point is, we, as long as we find the flames of slavery and we find these flames, we're not going to go anywhere. And we are the ones who have the, the church has the key if we will preach the gospel. And white people need to stop looking at themselves. I see young people, 16, crying on, 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 on the TikTok and everything and saying they don't want to be white. Well, you can take a shower for as long as you want. You're not going to change the <laughs> color of your skin. <laughs> the point is this. People have to appreciate that there were problems, but problems can What is conflict resolution? Why aren't, people are taking degrees in conflict resolution. Why aren't we using it to resolve conflict and move forward? Because we don't really want to resolve the conflict. Because yeah. as long as there's conflict, just like what happened with taking of the guns, no matter how small there's a crisis, people can take advantage of the crisis and grab power to themselves. That, that, that was a bold answer. You, you know who you remind me of? Do, do you ever, have you ever heard the black intellect by the name of Thomas Sowell? Yes, yeah, so I, I, uh, I, I actually started uh, reading his stuff from uh, 2020. I yeah. didn't, never knew, but he's, he's probably in his 90s now. He's in, yeah. he's in his late 80s or 90s. Yes. He's brilliant. He yeah, was yeah. always a bit of a contrarian in his viewpoints and things. Yeah. And, and the point he made <laughs> to black Americans, his fellow black Americans, yes. is you can't blame everything on slavery that happened 200 years ago. He says, you've got to get past that. And you can't be carrying that into the presence. And as long as you do, you're always a victim. And he's quite brilliant, though, and, yeah. and you know, he says it a lot. He says it you more see, like you than me. It, it, it's, it's like when you say, you know, uh, critical race theory is another big one. It talks about whiteness. There is much more to it. It's called critical race theory. See, when you put a theory to something, even if it's a lie or a cooked, cooked up tale by somebody who has a professor by their name, it's believed. So young people hear this and they say, well, whiteness is a condition. I beg you. That's a slippery slope because once you declare whiteness a condition and young white people hear that, once we kill all the white people because it's a condition or we give them a, 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 a needle to cure the condition, the next condition will be blackness. <laughs> the next condition okay. will be brownness. It's, you, you, you see what I'm saying? Well, what, about, go what about white privilege, though? White privilege, in my opinion, is something that is real. But when people are able to recognize that there's some privilege because of the color of their skin, it's, it's something that is changing. Why? Because if you go to a certain country, you're probably going to get more. If you go to China, if I go to China, I'm not going to have the, the Chinese people have more privilege than me as a black person. You know, black people are treated very badly in China. Does, does, does the media report that? No, they will not report that. But we know because we have people who have been to China and we know how they are treated. So it's not, this is, all, this is happening in different places. We have to be honest, we have to speak the truth, and we have to do our own research and not just watch what the media says. People are treated poorly in different parts of the world. You know, yeah. it, it does come back to the question I asked about yeah. the difference between racism and institutional racism. Yes. yes. And institutional racism is, as you rightly said, it's institutionalized. It's part yes. of the structure and framed in. Whereas we all have a little bit of racism in us. Do we not? I think so. We all have a certain bias or prejudice towards certain people. And in different countries, it, it's going to manifest differently. Even more because of the population and the homogeneous nature of that country. You know, the scripture says that all we like sheep have gone astray. The Bible says we have all sinned and done what? Fallen short of God's glory. And, and uh, what I've found is, if you study history a little bit, I'm not a great student of history, but I have some information from history, is every time a country becomes powerful and it's a certain race, there is always a tendency to oppress the next one down the road that's not as powerful. And if we go back thousands of years, we'll find out that Kush as, or Ethiopia as a, uh, an empire had slaves. 
Right. And you go around like that. It's been going round and round and round. But in the modern world, we're doing our best to stop that. And I think the church has a great part in doing that. And so many are accepting critical race theory, but I think it will blow up in our faces down the line. We'll be, we'll, people will come to realize, because every lie has an expiry date. But on the other side of that, I think there yes. are people that are saying they hear critical race theory on the other side yes, and yes. they just totally dismiss any conversation about yeah. thinking that maybe we do have prejudices and biases and don't even want to go there because that's yeah. critical race theory so I'm done. And yeah. I think that's also the kind of the other side where we have to be careful on. Yes, we, you, you want to listen. You want to listen and say what is, what is really going on. But, but dig into critical race theory and really see. One day I was talking to somebody and I said, I think it's a doctrine of devils. He said, what, how can you say so? That's really unkind. That's uncharitable. I said, hold on a second. What, what, what's a doctrine of the devil? Doctrine of devils. What is? First Thessalonians chapter 4. So I said, I want you to sh show me as a Christian one doctrine of devils. He said, oh, I don't know any. I said, well, I just showed you one. Prove to me that it isn't, and I'll prove to you that it is. And he says, well, how do you prove it? I said, simple. It's a doctrine of devils because, because the Bible says some will depart from the faith, giving heed to doctrine of devils. And that's why we have to be prayerful because it's in prayer that God opens our eyes to see what is the doctrine of devils. Jesus said, when we asked him about the end, he said, be careful that you are not what? Deceived. He didn't say what deception would look like. He just said, be careful. So a doctrine of devil is something that challenges the premise of the gospel. Right. And the gospel says, I am, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. If there's power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Greek or the Gentile, right? So with critical race theory, it demonizes one particular skin color. And I'm not saying this because, oh, I like white people over black people. I love everybody. Come to my church. You see, I love people. I don't, as long as you walk through that door, I want to love on you and bless you because that's what we're supposed to do. It's the way it is by the grace of God. Well, uh, let's, let's kind of try to shift the, the last few minutes of yeah. this discussion in that respect. So how do we endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace? What are the things that unite us? How do we overcome uh, these things that we see in the world that have uh, divided people over race, over mass, over vaccines, over you name it. The list goes on and on, doesn't it? People yes. are so divided. What are the things that unite us? What do we as Christian people need to do? What do we as the church need to do? So I just did something now that will drive some people away from me. But um, unity is not at all cost. We must be united. We must love people. When we speak what we consider to be the truth, in love. Now, it doesn't matter how much you want to be united. There are people who choose not to walk the ground of peace. That's why the Bible, the first verse you read, was it Ephesians uh, uh, 4.13 or something? 4.3, yeah. 4.3, yes. Yeah. That we should endeavor to maintain what? The bond. There's a, it, it's our responsibility to do everything. One other scripture says, do all that is in your power. I think it's the same one in a different version. Do all that is in your power. We have a responsibility to do all that we can to maintain peace. But let other people be the ones to walk away. Present the facts. Like when I say something, I've done some studies on it. And if I'm wrong, I'll come back and apologize. Maybe people won't accept the apology. But when I say something, for example, one time I talked about... Um, when we talked about racism, we talked about police shooting um, black people. You go on Statista and you check how many people died in 2020. Police shot more white people than black. Did you know that? It's on Statista. Check no. it out. For yeah. the last 10 years, it's been the same. Yeah. So we, that's the truth. It's a fact. But if I said it, some people would be so mad at me that I had the nerve to point that out. Well, you can get away with it easier than I can. Well, yeah, that's my <laughs> no, privilege. It's true. That's my privilege. Yeah. That's my privilege, but that, that's the truth. That we all, privilege is a word that exists, and it's true for many people depending on the circumstances. Yeah. So I have certain kinds of privileges for now. I'll yeah. write it and use it. You know, one of the things I like to point out to people is the day and age in which Jesus came to the earth was actually probably more divided than our world now. It was incredibly sexually immoral amongst the Romans, yes, amongst, yes, amongst the, yes, the Gentiles, the yes. Greeks. It was, the racism that existed was profound. Yes, they, exactly. treated, they treated Jews like garbage, like mm -hmm. non-humans. I agree. You could kill them, you could abuse them, you could do whatever you Rape wanted the, to. Rape the women, yeah. And, yeah. and Jesus comes in uh, with this message of grace and forgiveness and love and to love your enemy 
and to do good to those who hate you, to pray for those who persecute you. The Sermon on the Mount was a confrontation. It was the opposite spirit of all of the things that destroyed and distracted and divided people. Jesus came and turned that thing on its head, told them to love their enemy, told them to be good to, to people that, that, that did th go the extra mile. If he asked you to go one mile, go two. If, if he takes your, your shirt, give him your tunic as well. And you know, this whole idea of confronting people with radical love and radical forgiveness. And the fact that he healed the Gentiles and he ate with the sinners and he bridged the gap. And what he proved to the church was that you actually can do it. You can find unity in the midst of the most disparate world that ever existed. And when we look at our world that's so broken, we could throw up our hands and go, there's nothing I can do about it. It's so broken, it's so gone. Or we can say, no, I can do this. I can endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And a lot of people don't like our position on, on some things because it seems too kind of neutral, as I said earlier, but that's not the point. The point is I want to love all people and accept all people and have people come together. And I'm tired of fighting about stuff that doesn't really matter. Mm. Like the mask, for example, why would I, fight over a piece of cloth over your face. I'm not fighting about that. Yeah. Not prepared to do it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, with the <laughs> masks, you know, when it was mandated, we had to go, when you go grocery shopping, you have to put, I, I, people was like, oh, we, but it, it's nothing. It's a small thing you put on your face and, you know, and you go around, do what you want to do and come back home and that's it. Well, because the mask is making a big comeback. It was, <laughs> a, it was announced today okay. that the, the, the indoor mask mandates are on their way back so uh, within a week. Masks. And the church is going to be masked again. That's, that's what the uh, provincial government says. And so are we going to fight it? Are we going to argue about it? Or are we going to say, let's do what we're supposed to do and what Jesus has called us to do and not fight battles that he hasn't ca caused, called us to fight? Mm. Do you have a couple of questions there? No, we're good. We're all done. Everybody's good. And Deza, uh, so much, uh, I want to thank you for being here. I thank love you your so passion. Much. I love your insight into some things. I like the fact that you were able to speak really, really boldly to some things. I think it hopefully you're going to be helpful for some people. You said a bunch of things, a bunch of ways that I could never say. And I appreciate that. And I look forward to our friendship growing, you and me. And that we can, we can, you and I, single-handedly, two-handedly, can model to the world that you can get along with anybody because you're not easy to get along with. Yeah, I, oh, I, I was just going to say that about you. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows I'm kidding. I, I, I love this man dearly and we're great friends. And so th that, that's, we're going to probably leave it there. We're going to keep working towards this thing. Let's not make all of these things our battle. Let's make the mission of Jesus to bring the love of Christ and the gospel to the broken and Amen. lost. Let's make that our mission. Let's make that for, for, foremost and, and first place. And if we'll do that, I think everything else is going to take care of itself one way or another. All right. Thanks for joining us, Tim. What's coming up next? Yeah. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll be back next month for another exchange. And I think it's scheduled the day after the election. That's so right. I'm guessing there might be a topic there to discuss. So tune in next month. We have also lots of other things happening. Tomorrow is understanding our gifts, both in person here at Winnipeg South and online at churchoftherock.live at 7.30. Of course, we have weekend services in person and online. Next week is Power and Praise. Check the schedule tab on churchoftherock.live to see all that is happening. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.